All right, so this chapter is on axial and lateral resolution, and it's going to bring together a lot of the concepts that we've been discussing so far. And I think between this and the next chapter, two-dimensional imaging, <clears throat> it'll probably bring together everything that we've covered in the book so far. And that would also be the point where we conclude <clears throat> the DMS-150 class and um, call it a day, and then we'll start into some advanced concepts in dms uh, 151. So axial and lateral resolution, let's talk about exactly what these are here to begin with. So axial resolution is uh, required, I mean, resolution in general is uh, necessary to create an image of any kind. You have to be able to discern the uh, physical characteristics of uh, something that is three-dimensional in your image. So anytime you look at any picture, you're looking at, uh, at some degree of revolu resolution, the um, reflection of what that is when you compare it to the real object. And so when we talk about resolution, we talk about lateral, axial, and elevational re resolutions. Lateral resolution is the side to side, so is our sound beam as our pulse goes into the body, <clears throat> on each side of that pulse can be structures. And it's the ability to see one structure and not the other that is lateral resolution. And the closer together two structures are, and we can still discern them as separate structures, is our lateral resolution. Axial resolution, as the pulse goes into the body, the ability to um, discern structures along the path of the pulse um, is our axial resolution. So two structures closely together at slightly different depths. Uh, if we can discern them apart, we have the axial resolution to do so. If we can't, we are lacking axial resolution to separate them. Elevational resolution is perpendicular to both axial and lateral, which puts it in front of and behind your display screen, or if you will, along the thickness of your probe. So this is the front to back or thickness of your um, probe. If you are scanning through a liver and there's a tiny cyst in there, um, if you're always incorporating some liver tissue with the cyst and you never can separate them in the elevational plane, then you will not see the um, cyst very clearly because it will always have some echoes from the regular liver tissue around it. So that is elevational thickness. So let's talk about each of these uh, resolutions in more detail. So axial resolution is our ability to display structures that are close together along the line of sound propagation. We define this as being the spatial pulse length divided by two because of the round trip effect. We get the spatial pulse length and then we get to actually our axial resolution is half of that because of the round trip effect. And so it really does improve our imaging. Um, so SPL over two is the axial resolution. There's no other equation for it. Um, you have to remember, though, that axial resolution is determined by spatial pulse length, and spatial pulse length is, of course, dependent on both the wavelength and the, the speed of sound. And so it, it, this is definitely dependent on the source and the medium. And we want to be able to remember our equation for wavelength. Wavelength equals the speed of sound divided by the frequency. Um, so when I say that axial resolution is just simply the SPL divided by two, which is this equation that we give you, uh, don't forget SPL is lambda times the number of cycles. And so we have to know that lambda times the number of cycles is our SPL. And we have to know that lambda itself is the speed of sound divided by the frequency. And so we use this monomic um, a lot of uh, the C over lambda F. 
because we can solve for lambda by showing that uh, the wavelength lambda equals C over F. And that the little triangle helps us remember that equation. And we were able to weed out a couple of equations from that. The speed of sound equals lambda times the frequency. We never use that equation, but there it is. And frequency equals um, frequency equals uh, C over lambda. So even though we don't really use uh, these last two equations very much, they're there and they're built into the C over F equation. So because the wavelength is dependent on both the sound source and the medium, um, SPL is dependent on both. Um, this is certainly related to pulse duration We've already talked about pulse durations. The number of cycles times the weight, number of uh, excuse me, number of cycles times the the period of the sound, um, and so we're looking at the same thing, but in the distance domain instead of the time domain. Uh, we have uh, several synonyms that mean axial resolution. Uh, longitudinal. Uh, remember, sound is a longitudinal mechanical wave, so the movement is in the longitudinal, and that's what we mean by longitudinal. The axial resolution is along that movement of the, uh, the sound. Uh, axial, of course. Uh, range resolution. So the range, the distance from the reflectors uh, to the transducer, that's our range. Radial is a little different. Where that came from is the old uh, transducers uh, that uh, had a, that spun in a circle and had a radius to them. So I'm just going to take a second or 10 seconds here to show you a pulse moving in a longitudinal fashion. So this is how a pulse would actually move. Watch, the, there's the pulse and see it is moving longitudinally and not transversely. So that's a longitudinal pulse. We just demonstrated a longitudinal pulse. Um, now I want to demonstrate what I mean by radial. And I told you that that is how a crystal moves around in a circle. So I'll show you that. Um, so this is a single crystal transducer that I'm uh, showing you. Uh, it has uh, three crystals and they rotate around uh, a central axis and what happens is that when you turn it on you can see them spinning in a circle so that forms the radius and how far along uh, from the point of uh, the crystal you are is the radius of the circle and so that's where the radial uh, comes along is how far from the transducer uh, that spinning circle is created and so that's where the original sector image came from you can see it we are spinning the transducer and then it'll come to a stop here there we go that oh and then i'll put the yeah never mind i won't put the cap back on it all right let's pause a second all right so that explains why we call it radial resolution also and then of course depth resolution that's the range again that's another synonym for range. Um, so we have the depth resolution. All right, so again, the axial resolution is not adjustable by the, by the sonographer unless we were able to adjust the frequency. But even then, we don't know how many, we could, we could go up in the frequency, but we don't know how many cycles that the manufacturer adds in if we go up in frequency. They might add in 10 cycles if you go to, 8 megahertz from 4 megahertz. So we just don't know necessarily um, how to adjust the, the re axial resolution. Ranges for axial resolution are typically about a tenth to one millimeter. So they're very small and they're always smaller than lateral resolution. Okay. So short pulses are created by, and again, remember fewer cycles, shorter pulses. Less ringing by using backing material, we get a short pulse, and we also get 
fewer cycles per pulse that way. And then also by higher frequency, each cycle itself is shorter. Okay, so I was going to post a, uh, I was going to cut in here, do a jump cut with um, some backing material and show you how that actually works. But um, I can't, I need to do that as a separate uh, short presentation. It's all of about five seconds. Um, so I will post it separate. Uh, I just don't have the recorder set up to capture that right now. All right, so. But remember, shorter pulses, backing material, um, and then higher frequency, each cycle is shorter into itself, okay? So let's take a look at uh, some of those. Okay, so if we have a low frequency, uh, simply raising the frequency, you see the same number of cycles, and suddenly a higher frequency causes it to have a shorter pulse length than the low frequency. And then we have the option of, uh, again, at the higher frequency, we show five cycles here, and at the, or four cycles. And then at the low frequency, we show two cycles. So fewer cycles. Obviously, this on the right is shorter than the one on the left. The low frequency is obviously longer than the high frequency. And so that's how the uh, axial resolution works uh, in higher frequency, shorter pulses gives you the smallest possible uh, pulse length. Axial resolution is pulse length divided by two, and so there you are. Okay, lateral resolution is the ability to distinctly uh, identify two structures close together when they're side by side, perpendicular to the main axis. two reflectors that are side by side. We want to be able to separate them. And this is going to take a little bit of an explanation of how this happens. But your book hasn't really discussed yet how images are made. But let, let's just draw a, a quick drawing of the ultrasound image. And if we use a curvilinear probe, it looks something like this. OK. And if you want to see the uh, anatomy in there, I'll, I'll just add a, a small uh, baby in the picture. I'll draw a baby in. So here's a, my rendition of a fetus. Okay, make it a happy little fetus. All right, so this is the ultrasound picture. And the way that a picture is created is that a pulse is sent out along a line. And that's supposed to be a straight line, but I'm a terrible drawer. And this, um, and, and all the reflections along that line are then put into the image. So, and then the, the machine moves over and sends out another pulse, and all the reflections come back. And eventually, you know, you're getting reflections back from the anatomy over here, and the pulse is, you know, continuing on. And you're getting some reflections back that actually show uh, the anatomy along that pulse. And we just keep moving over and doing the same thing, sending out pulses until we've sent out enough uh, pulses across the screen in order to uh, make a, an image. Okay, And so that's how it's made. It's just a bunch of pulses sent out and reflections come back. Okay, and because we've been talking about how this um, this image is made from a a sound beam, and the sound beam has this shape to it, right? And so we have this pulse that comes out and follows the shape, and then anything that is anatomy along here that the sound beam reflects off of. We get an echo back, and that echo comes back to the transducer, and we get um, a little pulse into the transducer, which is sent to the system, and that's what ends up on our picture. Okay, and so this is one scan line. This represents this this um, this crystal here is representing one scan line, and so we're gonna clean this up a little bit. Let's get rid of this thing. <clears throat> 
better than that, I think. I don't know, maybe I can't. It's a little hard to erase with this wonderful technology we have. There we go. Okay, so we've erased our, our image there. And let's, let's draw again. So remember, the first scan line comes out. We send a pulse in, and the pulse changes shape as it goes down. Right? And we get echoes back. We move over, and we send out another pulse. All right? And the idea is that as long as two reflectors are farther apart than our beam width, we can resolve them, okay? So if I have a reflector right here, all right, it is going to send back pulses from the first reflection, but not from the second, okay? So it's not going to give, it's not going to overlap and send out pulses when we're doing this pulse over here, all right? We just get echoes back from the first pulse that's sent out. Now, if we um, have reflectors or send out, uh, if we have a wide, well, let's let's draw our reflectors first off. So if we have two reflectors that are far enough apart, we can send out a pulse and um, let's just draw our, our we're going to draw the beam shape like this now, okay? And the just because it's easier. Okay, so the reflections come back from the first one, and then we send out a second pulse, and we get reflections back from the second object, and that's well and good. That's exactly what we want. We want two objects with two beams uh, to be shown. Now, what happens if our objects are closer together? So let's try that. So we're going to put two objects a little bit closer together, and in this case, we're going to send out a pulse, and you see that only the pulse only hit one of them, but then when we move over, and we're going to just move over one, um, so let's redraw that a little better. Okay, so it's hitting one, and we're getting a... Um, a reflection back from just a little bit of it there, but that's a reflection, and it and it, and it considers that reflection to be um, an object. You know, that's an object. Let's face it. Okay, and then we send out our next pulse over here, and you can see that this actually hits both of them. So it hits both of them, and the system says, "Oh, I got a reflection back." And so what happens here is that on our screen, remember this is our screen now, right? Let me um, redraw that a little bit better. I'm going to make this part smaller, move it aside, and then draw our screen, what we're going to be imaging. Okay, so we're using a curvilinear array transducer. So we have a top like that. It fans out, and we have a bottom. Okay, so on our screen, when the first pulse hits this um, reflector here, it marks it as a little spot on the screen. Now, when it gets to the second one and hits that one, it also is hitting this one. And so we're getting it back from both of these. And the, mach the machine will say, oh, that's just a big spot on the screen. OK? So that means that our lateral resolution is not enough to resolve these two structures. And I'm just going to draw them in on the screen what they should have appeared as two separate structures but instead they have accidentally get shown as one big structure because we can't separate them in the lateral resolution and so when we sent out this scan line here you know when we sent out one over here it missed both of them we didn't get anything on our screen when we send out this one, we get a spot. When we send out this one, we get another spot, but they blend together, so it all appears as one spot. And we just keep sending out scan lines all the way across until we form an image. And in this case, our lateral resolution is not enough to resolve 
these two um, reflectors that are side by side. So lateral resolution is the ability to, dis to identify two structures close together when they're side by side. These structures are perpendicular to the main axis. We showed that on the picture. And so we say that what the minimum distance that two structures side by side can produce distinct echoes is, is lateral resolution. All right. The units are distance. And remember, smaller is better. The closer you can get them together, the better off you are. And lateral resolution is always equal to the beam width. That's the lateral resolution. And so as you saw in the, the picture that we had up there, um, in the near field, it's wide. In the far field, it's wide. And at the focus, it's narrow. The beam width changes with depth. So our synonyms for lateral resolution is um, lateral, of course, angular, remember the spinning uh, crystals, okay, they change their angle as they went across, okay, so that's angular, okay. Uh, transverse, or same thing as lateral, transverse, side, by, side to side, and something called azimuthal, which has to do with, again, that angle changing as you go across. So if you move something through a series of degrees, you're changing its azimuth. So that's where they get the word azimuthal. Don't worry about it. You'll uh, only see that on uh, these tests for the sonographic principles and instrumentation. You'll never use azimuthal again in your life unless you're reading a, a 14th century book on sailing, or probably an 18th century book on sailing. So our lateral resolution is always best at the focus. Anytime we're in that mythical, not mythical, but that real focal zone, it's considered good. Axial resolution is always going to be um, a smaller dimensional measurement than lateral resolution. So axial resolution is always better than lateral resolution. And as I demonstrated in the drawing, reflectors that are close together, um, closer together than the beam width, will show on the screen as single reflections. The things that determine lateral resolution is the aperture or crystal size, okay, or beam diameter, if you would, so the crystal diameter. Um, Harmonics makes a difference in lateral resolution because the beam uh, becomes narrower in harmonics than in regular imaging. And we'll talk about harmonics uh, in another farther chapter along. Uh, the frequency is important for lateral resolution as frequency extends the length of the near zone, thus changing the near zone and it changes the focal zone. So it's gonna have an effect on lateral resolution only for that reason, all right? And beam diameter, that's what's gonna have the greatest effect on lateral resolution is beam diameter. So beam diameter equals lateral resolution and it absolutely varies with depth under all circumstances. So let's uh, do a quick summary here of our uh, resolutions. Axial resolution is along the axis of the beam, so the ability to distinguish two structures along the axis of the beam. And in this drawing, we've drawn the crystal at the bottom of the image with the beam coming upward. Okay. Um, in lateral resolution, it is two structures side by side, okay, so side by side. So you can see that the beam width is narrow enough at the midfield, at the focus here, to separate these two structures into two distinct um, reflectors. But in the near field, it's not. So in the near field, this is going to appear as one reflector, and in the far field, this will appear as two reflectors. Uh, our monomic for remembering all the synonyms for axial is lard, and our monomic for lateral is lata. Uh, 
So lard and lata. Axial resolution is determined by the pulse length, and that does not change with depth. Lateral resolution is determined by beam width, and beam width absolutely changes with depth. Axial will change with frequency or by changing transducer, does not change with depth. Lateral does change with depth, as we now know that the beam changes with depth. So axial is best in the near field with a short pulse and in the far field with a short pulse. Doesn't matter, it's always better with a short pulse. Lateral is best in the near field with a small diameter transducer, and it's always better in the far field with the large diameter transducer. And it's always improved in the far field with high frequency. Lateral is not affected in the near field as much by high frequency, but when you get to the far field, it's improved by high frequency. Let's talk about focusing. So everything we've talked about with beam shape so far has been a discussion of a flat crystal. An unfocused crystal has a natural focal length, has a natural focus, okay? A flat crystal naturally focuses at a focal depth of the diameter of the crystal times the frequency divided by six, okay? We generally call this an unfocused ultrasound. Any other change that affects beam diameter is going to be caused focusing, called focusing. Okay, so if we change our beam diameter now, other than having it flat, we're going to be focusing it. So focusing concentrates the sound energy into a narrower beam and improves lateral resolution. Okay, there's four means of focusing. Um, though really we're only going to talk about uh, well we're not going to talk about the the mirror focusing which was an old-fashioned way that they used to do it uh, with those transducers that i showed you the single crystal ones we're not going to talk about mirror focusing but there's four other things we can talk about one is called uh, internal or external focusing where we put an acoustic lens over the crystal and that will focus the beam. Uh, another is internal focusing where um, we utilize a curved element. So we actually go in with the manufacturer and the manufacturer curves the element so that it is shaped and will then naturally focus the beam closer to the transducer. Um, the next way we could do it would be with what we call a phased array focusing. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. But phased array is our electronic focusing. And then finally, um, aperture size can change the depth of focus. So as we said, the, the greater the diameter, the, the larger the, the beam that is sent out, um, the deeper the focus. In the case of a small aperture size, uh, the closer the focus. So if you think about aperture size as the diameter of the beam, then that's exactly what we're talking about. Um, some people who are photographers know about f-stops on cameras. F-stops are a thing that adjusts the focus uh, depth of a camera. Aperture size is very similar to an f-stop. Okay, and I won't go into exactly what it is, but um, for our purposes, aperture size is beam diameter. For our purposes, uh, aperture and beam diameter are the same thing. So our focusing techniques uh, with a lens, this is an external technique. It's fixed, it's mechanical. Curved elements are internal. They're part of the crystal itself. It's also fixed, it's mechanical. Electronic is phased array, it's adjustable and it's electronic, and aperture is again phased array, or sometimes you'll see this on what's called an annular array probe. Um, I'm not going to go into annular array right now, but we'll get to it. Um, 
but if you have an annular array or a phased array, you can adjust the aperture. And I'll explain that on the next slide exactly how that's done. So adjustable electronic um, the aperture changes are adjustable and they're electronic. Um, apertures on an annular array are adjustable. And again, I'm going to go into annular arrays at another day. This isn't the time for them. All right, so focusing again, our fixed focusing techniques, conventional or with a mechanical focus, this is where you put a uh, lens on the on the crystal and you adjust the focus. Either of these, internal focusing or um, mechanical focusing with a lens are determined by the manufacturer and cannot be changed. Okay. Uh, so that's external lens focus and um, the internal curved array focus. Now, an external mirror focusing allows you to change it and again you still can't uh, I mean excuse me you can't change it but it allows you to focus it uh, we don't use mirrors anymore they're very obsolete and then an internal focus is, is simply where the PZT crystal is curved to concentrate the sound beam now the next thing we want to talk about is this thing called electronic focused array so when we look at this uh, image here on the right these are little tiny crystals that make up a phased array transducer. And these little tiny crystals, each one will send out a small wavelet. And these wavelets will add together and form a wavefront. So in this image, you see phased array steering. And down here, we see a wavefront that's curved. And this is phased array focusing. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go to a drawing to kind of show you briefly how this happens. Our drawing here, we're going to start out by drawing a linear array transducer, um, which is composed of many little crystals. And so I'm just going to draw the crystals like this. And when they make these, they actually uh, will take a large crystal and cut it. And so I'm not really that far off from how it's actually made. Now, one thing I do want to do here is I want to um, fire off each of these little crystals with a voltage. And I'm going to represent the voltage with a little drawing like that. And you're going to see this. Um, drawing again and again. Let's see, I guess that's not quite showing up. There you go. All right. And so what that represents is a small voltage that hits this little microcrystal. Let's see. Hits the little microcrystal and causes a little wavelet to go off. And then the next crystal that is fired will be shot just a slight bit of time later. And so it'll go off. Oops, there we go. And then the first one continues to propagate. All right. And then we'll hit another crystal. Oops. Let's make the time a little bit later. So the, the length of these um, the length of these voltage gaps is demonstrating the time delay in firing off the crystal. And so this crystal is going to be a little bit later. And remember, the, the first one continued to propagate. The second one propagated some more. And now we're hitting the third one. And we're going to continue doing that on down the line, later and later voltage firings. until we get as many as we want fired off. And these will all fire off and propagate and fire off and propagate. 
And because of what we call Huygens effect, it then forms a wave front. So you remember Huygens principle, all these little wavelets form a wave front and sound travels perpendicular to a wave front. So this will then travel in this direction. And now I want you to note, pay attention here. You see how I drew the delays, the time delays, so that each line was a little longer. And now you can see that the sound is gonna travel perpendicular to where those time delays are. So this is how we do electronic steering. And if we want to do electronic focusing, we do the same thing with an electronic array probe. And I'm just going to draw a quick one over here. And in this case, we're going to fire off the ones on the end first, and then next one's a little bit later, and then the middle one's last. And that will have the effect of sending out our little wavelets in. These will go off first and propagate, and then the next ones will fire off, and then the last ones will fire off. And we'll have something along the lines of this, where the wave front now, if we draw the wave front in, the wave front is curved. Okay. And again, the wave will still move perpendicular to the wave front. So you see it's moving in perpendicular in a fashion that's going to come to a point called the focus. And so when this happens, you'll see the, the shape of the sound beam is like that. Okay? It's all moving towards the focus. And then after the focus, it spreads out and diverges. So that's our electronic focusing that we're going to learn to do with phased array transducers. All right. That gets us back to our image here, where our uh, transducer now is an electronic transducer focusing the sound using Huygens principle and a wave front that's converging. So when we look at our um, different effects of focusing, um, the beam diameter in the near field will always narrow. The focal point will always move closer to the crystal, to the transducer, compared to an unfocused ultrasound. The near zone length is always reduced. In a focused ultrasound, the beam diameter beyond the focal zone is wider than an unfocused ultrasound. So therefore, focusing improves near zone and degrades the far zone. And with this also, the size of the focal zone, that area around the focus of good imaging, is always reduced. So uh, focusing is a useful technique. Is it a good technique? It's hard to say because it always makes the far field worse. Um, but that's why we put our focus always at the deepest part of our image, is we're trying to make everything in the near field. So let's summarize our beam features. Okay. So uh, frequency is determined by the ultrasound system. In continuous wave, it's determined by the pulsar that sends out the signal to the crystal. In pulse wave, it's determined by the thickness of the crystal and the speed of sound in the crystal. Our focal length is determined by the diameter of the crystal and the frequency of sound. Just as in the far field, the divergence is determined by the diameter of the crystal and the frequency of the sound. Lateral resolution is determined by the beam width. So that concludes chapter 11.
And I know that's a lot of information, or, excuse me, chapter 10. Uh, that concludes chapter 10, and that's a lot of information, but it should be bringing together a lot of what we've been learning so far. Okay, now chapter 11 will just bring even more of it together and give you a summary of a picture. 